I just know I, I'd love to focus a little bit more on the disability piece mm -hmm. and how people, because I know that you go places where people don't treat you like a human oh. being. And what? why are people with disabilities, why is it important to come include everybody in the community? Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'll start with why it's important first. It's important because that's what community is. Um, the moment you start deciding who can and cannot be in your community, you devalue the community. Uh, it's important for people with disabilities to be included in the community because we're, we're one fifth of the population. We're 60 million strong. Um, and that's, so if you add just the 60 million and mom and dad, we're half of the country. So if you start talking about 334 million people in this country, and half of us are related or connected to an individual that may have a medical complex medical need or disability, if you start making community inclusive to us, you make it inclusive to everybody. Um, one of the things that I like to tell people is that, no, we don't need ramps. I'm like, well, you're not going to be 29 forever. You're not going to be young to bride. And you're not promised the ability to run up and down the hillside for the rest of your life. So, why not plan for that eventuality? It's like, um, you know, they, we, we, did a, we did a big push to get curb cuts uh, in automatic doors, and people are like, I don't understand where curb cuts, why do you need curb cuts? And I've seen more mamas with them big ass strollers <laughs> using new curb cuts and automatic doors than I care to imagine. <laughs> Now the irony is that those were the same people that were offended that we were trying to get put in. So it's like, if you make it accessible to some, you make it accessible to all. And again, it goes back to, like, I've, I've been self-employed for 20 years now. If I, if I only pick and choose people that I like, then there's no guarantee that I'll have a job tomorrow. But if I'm accessible to everybody, then my, my consumer base, or my product base, or my revenue base is broader. You know, that's when we're talking to, you know, when we talk to the Chamber of Commerce, I'm like, okay, you want to talk about money, but if you are literally just by benign neglect or passive aggressive comfort, because, excuse me, the reason I say disability needs included is because we challenge people's mortality. Like, people have looked at me and go, oh, God bless you. You're so strong. I'm like, I'm just going to the damn store. Like, that's not strength. That's me being hungry. Right? <laughs> but it's sort of like if you've never seen it, when you see it, you don't know how to react. Um, it's really about making sure that everybody in the community feels like they're part of the community. Doesn't mean you gotta like everybody. Right? You know, but if you open it, if you are, if you open up your shop and you're, and you're servicing the public, the public comes in all shapes and sizes, orientations and colors, abilities and not. But the moment you start saying, well, Keith, I would love to have a ramp, but then you're not interested in money because you literally are cutting out. It's not just people with disabilities. It's seniors who have mobility issues. It's people who are coming from other countries who want to come, and they have a different concept of what inclusion is. Like particularly if your if your economic base is tourism, mm -hmm. then the if you are completely accessible, then you've now quadrupled your ability to make money because it's a marketing tool. Right? Sure, you can go up and down the Oregon coast, but here in Tumwater County, the entire family can come, all generations. Where the grandma is on the ventilator and using a hover around, or you know, it's all of that stuff, and that's just. <coughs> I mean, I think about inclusion not just about a social strata, but if you want to be better, you know, you don't necessarily have to want to be better. But if you like money, right? Like I always go, to, I like look, greed and selfishness are like core to like some some people. So you appeal, you appeal to their selfishness and their greed. Do you like money? Yes. Well, you know how much more money you can make if more people came to your store and bought more of your product. And all you have to do is open the door. All you have to do is widen the door four inches and put a ramp. 
you're good to go. But people get terrified because as much as they love me, when I show up, they panic because they are like, oh my God. I literally had one person say, well, I would love you to come into my shop, but what happens if you fall? I was like, well, I bust my ass. What happens if I fall, right? <laughs> now, if you push me down, that's a whole different life, you know? But, but I can also say that if you are um, being subversive and being, like, evil, then maybe I'll slip and fall on purpose. <laughs> and then I'll test you, because the key words in business are liability. And they always talk about, well, we would love to have such and such, but we don't want to be liable. Well, you know, uh, I was telling the kids at school yesterday about me and my friends going to a club. They didn't want to let us in because they thought we were a liability. They said, well, if you have four wheelchairs in this place, there's going to be a fire hazard. How are you going to get out? Well, how are you going to get out? Mm -hmm. right? If the house is, if everybody on fire and you're in the back, how are you getting out? Because I'm going to be outside looking. Well, I'm being like, I trust. Self-preservation kicks in with the other disability or not. So it really goes down to... It's a mind shift, right? It's just like in the 50s and the 60s where people were like, it was normal to not allow people of color to vote. Five generations before that, it was normal not to let women vote, right? And now political parties are predicated upon women votes and votes of color. So if you make community accessible, it makes your community richer, maybe not you know, in the way that people like it, but you can then advertise and market yourself. And, you know, just for the esoteric part of it, it's just about making it easier to, to keep Tillamook County being Tillamook County. Thank you. Do we have another question? Yeah, I have one. Um, yeah. Pretty quick. Sure. That I think is on people's minds a lot. How do you assume competence with someone with a disability, yet um, be available to help? And, and not cross that boundary. You know, you said that you don't want to be um, pitied and things right. like that, but how do you, I guess, what's the pathway to just to just be more comfortable in those situations for people out here and, and, and not having it be a, a scary thing? Right. Or, oh, gosh, this person's coming over here. How do I deal with this? Yeah, I... Um I, I take it from two points. Like, well, one, I'm a person uh, with a disability, but I'm also a son of a mother who had no concept of disability until I showed up. So there's two parts. One is that um, you, you presume confidence just like, I guess for me, I look at it like if, if, if you walk into a store, do you want somebody to go, oh, welcome do you need anything today? And they'll be really condescending as opposed to letting you walk through the store, right? And if you need help, you ask for help. Um, presuming confidence just means you presuming they're human, right? You say, okay, this person looks like they're having difficulty. If that person looks like they're having difficulty and they have a disability, do you also do that to the person who looks like they're having difficulty and they don't have a disability? Right? So if, you be, if you're consistent with your behavior across humanity, that's not the issue. Um, presuming competence has been, because we've been, we've been ingrained to think that a person doing anything with a disability is superhuman. Because disability is then cast as a negative thing or a burden on family or a tragic incident has happened. That's why you see people talk about you know, they don't want to be seen as disabled. They want to be seen as something else. You know, in the disability community, there's a struggle between people who were born with a disability because that's all we ever know. Right? It's like, so I don't have that backdrop of when I wasn't disabled. And then you have people who acquired their disabilities. And so presuming competence should just be presuming competence across humanity. Um, and that's usually where it starts. And always think that if somebody wants help, they'll ask for it, right? Because like when I go to a door, if the door is stuck and I'm struggling and then somebody comes along, I'll say, excuse me, can I get a help? But I've been in places where I'm doing stuff and people, oh Lord, he needs help. And they'll run over and pull the door open and, swing, and fling me across. I'm, 
I was going that way. What the hell are you doing, right? Um, like, I've had friends who are visually impaired and blind that were just standing at the crosswalk, waiting across the street, and literally somebody grabs them by the arm and drug them across the street, completely in the opposite direction of where they were going. And then they got mad because they got cussed out. Well, I thought you were blind and you needed my help. But you didn't ask. You made an assumption. And it's always, it's, uh, you can assume whatever you want. The moment you actuate on that assumption, that's when it becomes a problem. So I always say presume confidence as, it's an old adage, treat people the way you want to be treated. So if somebody, so you don't, if, if, if people talk to you in a condescending tone because you have a goatee, right? You know, and then you know, that's, that's stupid, but if they talk to you as Mr. Chick and showing you the respect of you being a human, then that's a different kind of, that's a different presumption. And that's usually how I try to get people to deal with it is don't, yes, I have a disability, but that's not, that's what I have. That's not who I am. Right. So that's a huge distinction in how to handle people. Thank you. One of the things that I keep thinking about and I think has been a struggle in the world of diversity and inclu uh, inclusion and equity mm -hmm. is the representation of diverse communities when we look at the disability rights movement. I'll tell you a story. So, a friend of mine, so Ferguson, Michael Brown, the whole incident, that's my neighborhood. So I lived. As a kid, I literally lived like three blocks from where all that happened. So, you know, hands up, don't shoot, Black Lives Matter. Then a friend of mine calls me from St. Louis who has a disability because she went down to protest. And they were like, you know, yeah, we're going to fight the man. We're going to fight the man. Oh, sister, you have a disability. Well, it's going to be dangerous. We want you to stay here while we go march. Like, well, they, so you want me to be a stationary target? <laughs> right, as opposed to being moving target. Um, so the, the, the diversity, the, the discussions have been, again, predicated around disability. The reason disability is not in the diversity conversation is because we challenge mortality. People will look at us and go, oh, but I'm, you know, I'm just talking about race and gender. I'm not, yeah, that, because it makes it uncomfortable. Um, and then when you talk about disability rights, like I stumbled into the independent living movement and in 98 I did a workshop around how to do cross, at the time, cross-cultural, cross-disability outreach, urban, suburban, and rural. And I, it just seemed like something you would do if you were doing outreach, right? And I put it in for the conference, you needed 35 people to sign up. They signed up. I was like, okay, cool. They opened up the room. There were 300 people in the room. Because they had never, we never thought about it. And I had to pause and I said, people are not monoliths. People are mosaics. So what do you tell the transgender immigrant child from Haiti, who is ESL, who is the translator for his mother? What are you telling them? There's nowhere for them? in the diversity. So the conversation really is not about what hasn't happened. The, qu the question has to be, who's benefiting from not having that discussion? Because what I've seen in the last 20 years, 30 years of being an independent living movement is there is no moving up in the leadership. There is no, there is no progression in terms of Oh, I was an advocate, now I'm an executive director, now I'm a candidate. Like, there's, no, there's no progression in that. One of the things that I've suggested is just to have the hard compass, just put it on the table. Because when people talk about, well, welcome to our day of diversity. My name is Keith, and we're going to talk about being black. <laughs> Hi, right? But they're asking me to ignore every other part of my existence. Um, so when I did, so we did an LBGTQ march way back in the day, and we were the first ones to include disability. But when we had it, we had a transgender woman in the room who was deaf, and people couldn't figure it out. 
Like, so she has to pick either being deaf or being transgender. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you making her bifurcate her identity? Mm -hmm. Because you suck at what you do. Right? <laughs> and so, if you're going to do diversity work, the work, the word is diversity. Right? So if you have a net, now, when people say we're going to have a day of diversity, what you stop and say, well, define your diversity. Are you talking about ethnic diversity, religious diversity, socioeconomic diversity, and then people, because then you'll see whether or not they're actually doing the work for, for the work to get done, or they're looking for the, the accolades that will come with the fact that they had this event. And so there is, there's, a, there's an economic to it, there's, a, there's, a, there's an employment thing to it where people get on the treadmill and like, hey, I'm doing diversity trainings, I made all this money doing diversity training. And if you've ever been to diversity trainings, you literally want to pull your eyeballs out of your head with a fork. Because they suck. And they're not really dealing with the crux of the issue. The reason we need diversity in America is because it's historic. You know, Oregon has a very, very distinct ethnic and racial history. Has Oregon dealt with that fact? So when you have a discussion about diversity, you cannot have it in a vacuum. And what I've learned about having those issues is that people, people want to do the soft, squishy part around the edges. They don't want to do the hard stuff and say, okay, you know, up on the, up on the books up until 1987, though it wasn't necessarily enforced, I couldn't come to the state of Oregon. Why is that? So if you're talking, so if you want to have a discussion in Oregon about <coughs> diversity, you have to deal with the historical rationale. If you're talking about disability, the, I'm trying not to laugh because I know some of these people and they're all on TV and they're like, look, and we're so disabled and we love it. You know, because now, the thing about disability is there's always a sexy disability. So the current sexy disability is autism. Mm -hmm. And the fight in the community between um, Autism Speaks and ASAN is ASAN, which is the Autism Self-Advocacy Network, is that it's run by people with disabilities, mm -hmm. run by people with autism, who know it, who live it. Autism Speaks was developed by parents mm -hmm. who suddenly decided, suddenly found out their child had autism, and then they had resources. The fight in the community about diversity is that even with that, there's no representation about kids of color with autism. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to get into the leadership, or even kids who are, who identify out on the, on the, on the gender spectrum. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you self-identify? And so the, the fight about diversity and inclusion has been really dealing with the people who put it on. Because it's like, if you're really going to do this work, like the reason they don't like calling me is because I don't have the time for the BS. <laughs> because when I leave the room, yes, today I'm Keith Jones, hooray! But the moment I go outside, I'm black and I'm crippled. And America does not let me forget that. <laughs>